Hi, thanks for tuning into this episode of Is Jesus in Genesis? This is uh, chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. You're going to love this one. So if you have not read Genesis chapter 11, uh, verse 1, all the way through verse 9, stop this video or pause it, read that, come right back, and we'll be waiting for you. Welcome back. So if you want a memory verse, it is this one. Therefore, its name was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. That's Genesis 11 verse 9. So in the 10th chapter of Genesis, if you'll remember, we are told that Japheth's offspring had their own language. Yet in the very first verse of chapter 11, it says that there was only one language in the whole earth. So is that a contradiction? Is the Bible unfaithful? Is this evidence of an uninspired text? The answers are no, no, and no. As we arrive in the 11th chapter of Genesis, we see yet another instance of biblical recapitulation. So if you don't remember what recapitulation is, that is retelling the same story, but with a different emphasis. In chapter 10, we have the spreading of mankind across the whole planet, the populating, uh, the population of the world. And the focus on that side of the story is regarding each of Noah's sons and their roles in how the world was populated. The first nine verses of chapter 11, though, are also about mankind populating the whole world. But this This version of the story, this recap, focuses on God having to get involved because of man's sin. So here's the story. We're about a hundred years after the flood. Uh, It's about the time that Noah's great, great, great grandson, Peleg, was born. Many of Noah's descendants are in open rebellion now, though. Their fathers, and certainly Grandpa Noah, Uh, gave that message about filling the whole world, right? Filling the earth. They have extended that message to their offspring, uh, the same message they got after getting off the ark, but these descendants have refused to do so. In fact, at some point, they found a nice plane uh, in the land of what we now call Iraq, and they have decided to stay put instead of spreading out. Now, it's not long until after they've made the following declaration in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, quote, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, that's exactly what God wanted them to do, right? Scatter abroad. But they're in open rebellion. No, we don't want to do that. So it is just, it's fascinating to me how quickly mankind falls into rebellion. I mean, come on. It's only been a century since everyone alive, except for eight people, were drowned in a worldwide flood. And yet they are disobeying God to his face. In fact, Nimrod, whose kingdom began in Babel, was not only, quote, a mighty hunter before the Lord, some Jewish uh, interpretations, their their manuscripts, actually render that as a mighty, mighty hunter in the face of God. So it appears that Nimrod's kingdom didn't care about God's mandate to populate the whole earth. And his focus was on making a name for his own kingdom. However, God had other plans. It says that God came down to see the city and tower that they were building up. Now, our best efforts to make a name for ourselves are pitiful when compared to the glory of God. We, we may become famous, we, but we will never be famous forever. It's just not going to happen. Have you heard of a guy named Ferdowsi? Never heard of Ferdowsi? Or how about this one? I can't even pronounce it because the name isn't in common anymore. It's uh, Murasaki Shikibu. I think that's it. You ever heard of him? How about this, this guy, Athelstan? Ever heard of that guy? All three of those people, I'm not even sure how to pronounce their names, but I know that you have probably not heard of them But if you lived a thousand years ago, you knew exactly who those people were because they were famous. How about this? If you know guitar, do you know this guitar picker and singer songwriter? His name is John Dowland. 
Ever heard of John Dowland before? Famous guitar picker, songwriter. No? Well, he was quite the celebrity 500 years ago. Maybe you know the name of Thomas Nast. Do you know him? I mean, he died in the 1900s. He's the father of the American cartoon. You never heard of him. No matter how many big lights illuminate the billboard, you will never be more famous than Jesus, no matter what John Lennon said. And, and I would like to just pick, pick out a couple of things from this text and, and draw your attention to them. First, um, this is really often overlooked. Most of the time, we skip over the fact that God came down, not once, but twice. The first time God came down was in verse 5. He simply observed the city and the tower. The second time he came down was in verses 7 and 8. God came down to earth with the intention of confusing the speech of these rebels and scattering them abroad. Did you catch that? I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you might have accidentally missed the point, so I'm going to repeat it with some emphasis. The Lord God, the, the King of creation, came down from heaven to earth. God was on earth. And then when he was on earth, God confused this singular language of mankind into many new languages in order to prompt his creation to fulfill his purposes, the ones that he had given them when they got off the, uh, got off the ark. It was not a divine wink of the eye from the throne room of heaven while looking down through clouds. No, God was physically here on earth when he initiated the confusion of tongues. Did you ever notice that before? On one hand, on one hand, I would have really liked to have seen that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if I was there, that meant I was in open rebellion to God. So I probably, thinking about it, you know, maybe I don't want to have seen that. But I have some questions. I have some questions about God coming to earth. Like, did angels announce his arrival? Did he present himself like an ordinary human? Did he make his appearance at the top of the tower and then walk down? Or maybe he appeared at the base and then walked up. Did he tell everyone what was going to happen and why? Did he chastise them? Did he kill the leaders? Did he say that if it were not for a rainbow covenant, that he would destroy them again and their puny little tower would be washed away? Did he remind them that they were told to spread out over the face of the entire earth? Did he yell at them? Or maybe did he just simply shake his head and wonder? In fact, in fact, maybe the Lord simply came down to the edge of the city and nobody even noticed him. All we know is that the Lord descended and confused their language. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is that in the academic religious world, this event is called a theophany. Do you ever hear of that? A theophany. A theophany is when God physically manifests himself on earth. Typically, it's in an, uh, in an observable way. This is the first time in Babel, it's the first time since the Garden of Eden that we have mention of this happening in the Bible. It's the first theophany since early Genesis, when, when God was in, the Eden, was in Eden at the Garden. So knowing that, knowing that, I would like to make two points. Number one, the face of God the Father has never been seen by man. And number two, we have no examples in Scripture of the Holy Spirit appearing in human form. So if both of those statements remain true, then this is not just a theophany. There is a very good case to be made for this being a Christophany. A Christophany is the same as a theophany, except for this difference. Instead of God making an appearance, it is actually Christ 
making the appearance. Now, that kind of puts a new slant on this story, doesn't it? It's entirely possible that it was Christ himself who came to earth to pronounce confusion on the tongues and ears of his creation, and in doing so, scatter mankind in every direction so that they would comply with his divine dictate when they got off the ark. Remember, God's purpose from Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 was this, quote, be fruitful and fill the earth. I think they got the hint after this. In fact, we only need go back one chapter, chapter 10, to see just how fruitful they became and see how far they spread out. So humanity was given a mission and a mandate from God, and eventually that mandate was fulfilled, even though it took God getting involved. But here's an interesting note. As God scattered people by using different languages in Genesis chapter 11, he also gathered people of different languages together in the book of Acts chapter 2. Now, One miracle spread people out because it was made impossible for them to understand the single language of many speakers. The other miracle brought people together because a single speaker was able to be understood in many languages. But the result of both miracles was the same. The world was changed forever. The building of the tower had this purpose for Nimrod. Nimrod would stay in control of the masses and hinder the fulfillment of what God commanded, the spreading of humanity across the whole earth. And what happened? God intervened and used their rebellion to do the opposite of what they wanted. Likewise, in Acts, the purpose in persecuting Christians was so that those in power, like the Sanhedrin, would stay in control of the masses and hinder fulfilling what God wanted, which was spreading the gospel across the whole earth. What happened? If you, as you read in, in Acts even more, God intervened, and he used their rebellion, the Sanhedrin's rebellion, to do the opposite of what they wanted and spread the gospel across the world. Before the confusion of languages in Genesis chapter 11, and before Pentecost happened in Acts chapter 2, there was another similarity in these stories. Both incidents were preceded by the same thing happening at two different points in history. Both events were heralded by God himself coming down from heaven to visit his creation. The first time God came down, he said that because they were united as a people, nothing would be impossible for them. The second time God came down, he said that nothing would be impossible for those uniting in his son. And who is his son? That's Jesus. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. Be sure and like, comment, forward this video to others, share it, and subscribe. I really do appreciate it. You have a great day. Be blessed.